think we'll make a start and I expect other people to join us as we go on. Um, so welcome everyone, welcome to this uh, Morris Block uh, lunchtime uh, seminar. It's my pleasure to introduce today our presenter, Dr. Connie uh, Guell. Uh, Connie is a senior lecturer at the University of Exeter Medical School and she's a medical anthropologist with her work focusing on how healthy living is shaped uh, across the life cycle. Uh, Connie's uh, keen on developing and uh, refining methodologies uh, and that leads us nicely to Connie's talk today, uh, Upscaling Qualitative Research, New Promises, Old Pitfalls, where we're going to learn about new approaches to uh, secondary qualitative data analysis, which includes uh, machine learning, which I'm, I'm particularly interested to, to hear about. Um, so Connie is going to leave time at the end of the seminar for questions. So please, uh, if you have burning questions throughout the presentation, then please type them in the chat box and I will, uh, I will relay those to Connie uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the presentation. Uh, so without further ado, Connie, I'll I'll hand over control to you. Thanks very much, Tim. <clears throat> Just checking that you see my slides. Yeah. Um, thanks very much, everyone. Um, and thanks for the invitation, Tim. Um, a real pleasure to talk here. Obviously, it would have been great to come to Glasgow. So I'm speaking to you from, uh, from Cornwall. So the University of Exeter has a campus in, has two campuses in Cornwall. Uh, one is the Knowledge Spa, where I'm usually based in, uh, well, not in the last 12 months, but I'm hoping to be back there soon. It's a real pleasure to talk about upscaling qualitative research. Um, and I thought of, um, this in terms of new promises and all pitfalls. Um, and here's just a quick overview of what I want to talk about. So I start with talking um, about why we might want to upscale qualitative research. And just as a disclaimer, I um, won't use this um, talk to convince you of qualitative research. So I'm taking this as a given that qualitative research is a useful tool in our box for population health research. Um, so I'm just talking about what might be interesting about upscaling qualitative research. And I thought I'd focus on three examples for this, an evidence synthesis, and then a primary study uh, where we upscaled qualitative research, uh, a secondary study where we used um, AI, uh, machine learning or text analytics. And then I just want to review a bit at the end what these promises and pitfalls, so um, opportunities and challenges could be in this. So just to start, what do we mean by upscaling? So I'm using upscaling here just as a shorthand for developing or analyzing unusually large qualitative data sets. So that might be multi-site, multi-method qualitative research projects, um, or it might be pooling several small qualitative data sets, and that might be in a systematic review, or that might be for secondary data analysis. And why would we want to upscale qualitative research? Um, so this is definitely not about um, saying that uh, maybe we have insufficient sample size in qualitative research and might lack saturation. I think I could probably do a whole talk on the very problematic term of saturation. So there is real strength in qualitative research um, in small scale context specific context sensitive um, uh, approaches to research. So um, instead, I just want to ask the questions, do we maybe want to develop new approaches to respond to particular research questions? And do we want to develop new approaches um, to changes in expectations, opportunities uh, in our field? And one of these might be um, recent calls uh, for uh, what you might call less research, more thinking. Um, lots of people have written about this, um, but Trish Greenout um, puts it very nicely here in this uh, blog she wrote in 2012, where she says, with due respect to all those who have used more research as needed to sum up months or years of their own work on a topic, this ultimate academic cliche is usually an indicator that serious scholarly thinking on the topic has ceased. It's almost never the only logical conclusion that can be drawn from a set of negative, ambiguous, incomplete or contradictory data. And lots of people wrote about it in, in different ways, um, but a lot of it is about calling for more innovative research designs, innovative ways of thinking about problems to under, um, understand, for example, complexity, systems, underlying mechanisms. 
We've also seen calls um, around open access data, especially from funders, um, calls for data sharing, um, and that includes qualitative data. So, for example, from the NIHR um, and from the UKRI. Just to pick the UKRI um, uh, example where they talk about what they might see promises in open access data. They say access to data across many fields is uh, stimulating new types of thinking as researchers develop new understandings by bringing together data from a variety of sources. This is enabling new perspectives on multidisciplinary problems across a wide variety of fields. So now all this obviously applies to quantitative and qualitative research. Um, but all these um, uh, might inspire us to think of qualitative research in different ways and perhaps wanting to upscale it. But also, of course, it poses uh, very unique challenges when we think of qualitative data. And I just put the three obvious ones down here, one that qualitative research data just tends to be bound to the context that was produced in the setting, but also the researcher. It's not really easily anonymized for easy open access data or de-identifiable. So when we remove context descriptors, we remove meaning and we might remove understanding. And there's really limited feasibility uh, in analyzing and interpreting large volumes of textual data with traditional approaches, our kind of manual ways of um, uh, analyzing qualitative data. So I just wanted to give three examples how we might think through this and how we try to apply these sort of challenges to our own research. And just to start with an obvious one, the probably most common way we are upscaling qualitative research at the moment is through systematic reviews and evidence um, uh, reviews. Um, and I just wanted to start with a walking group um, systematic review we just finished last year. Um, so this was a meta ethnography. And for those of you who are a bit familiar with meta ethnographies, um, we relied heavily on the little blue book by Noblet on Hair and their methods for um, undertaking uh, this kind of evidence synthesis. But basically we upscale, we pulled together, first identified and then synthesized 22 qualitative studies on experiences and perceptions of group walking. So those were studies from the UK, US, Ireland and Australia. And we looked at this to develop a new conceptual understanding of the walking group um, uh, experience or group walking experience. So we looked at all the conceptual thinking in these papers by these authors and from these we derived five higher order constructs. Just briefly there were seeking and enjoying health and fitness, attachment to walking, providing purpose and confidence, mobile companionship and a peaceful and contemplative shared respite from everyday life. And we took these um, different constructs and argued that uh, participating in a walking group provides a set of experiences that together constitute a specific form of shared or communal therapeutic mobility. So that's just a really snapshot um, example of doing this kind of very conceptual way um, of synthesizing evidence. And I took the slide from my colleague Judith Green uh, for a workshop we've undertaken for the SSM. Um, and I picked this example of a meta ethnography at the beginning of the talk because they're quite well rehearsed promises and pitfalls when synthesizing qualitative outputs. So we might have more pragmatic ways of doing this um, where we summarize and synthesize evidence or perception views and experiences of participants written about in these different studies. And to analyze these, we might use thematic analysis or synthesis or framework synthesis approaches. But then we have the more interpretive ways of doing this kind of um, synthesizing of qualitative outputs where we want to translate concepts of researchers and really develop this work. So meta ethnography is probably the most common one. And we do have um, challenges with either of these approaches. Um, so for a more pragmatic approach, we're concerned about decontextualizing data and perhaps overly focusing on first order constructs. So these are these um, direct perceptions of participants. And with more, with more interpretive approaches, we might um, worry about comprehensiveness in our approaches, um, about transparency um, to describe these interpretive ways of analyzing. And it is perhaps still a bit poorly applied in health research. So I'm starting with this because some of these concepts will follow through this talk in terms of the, the positives we might take at the opportunities, but also the challenges. 
So the second example is about um, a, a policy analysis um, that we undertook in seven Caribbean countries. I thought I, I share a few different research projects and topics with you. So it's not just dry about the methods itself. Um, and this was a project funded by the um, IDRC in Canada. Um, and my thanks to co-authors, Maddie Murphy, Nigel Anwen, Alafia Samuels, Trevor Hassel, and Lisa Bishop. So many of these colleagues at the University of the West Indies. Um, just very quick background on this. So NCDs are a significant burden in the Caribbean region, like many uh, low and middle income regions. Um, and in 2007, heads of government of the CARICOM, the Car uh, Caribbean community, um, came together to commit to a range of um, policy measures, quite wide ranging upstream structural policy measures, for example, tackling trade and transport systems. So really interesting policy statement made in 2007. In, in a big policy evaluation, we uh, seven years on, we try to um, look at trends and risk factors and morbidity and mortality since this declaration. We want to look at national and Caribbean wide policy responses and factors associated with policy successes or difficulties, and then looked at a range of other things, for example, the international impact of the declaration. So this declaration probably directly led to the UN high level meeting on NCDs in 2011. Um, so our qualitative seven country study fits into this second objective. So we wanted to investigate the policy progress made, and we also wanted to look at, um, analyze the process that might have helped to hinder the development or implementation of policies. So this was a region-wide um, policy effort. So we felt we want to upscale and not just look at um, one or two countries and their progress. So we looked at seven countries, we did a policy document analysis across these seven countries, and we also ended up um, conducting 76 semi-structured interviews with 80 stakeholders from government, civil society and the private sector. And I'm just wanting, uh, one, wanted to talk a bit through the challenges of doing this rather large qualitative study that might challenge some of our usual methods. So the obvious one, I guess to start with is how to scale up resources in a study like this. So how to undertake research across seven settings with relatively limited resources. So we ended up having researcher teams in two regional hubs to do all these interviews. Um, we planned the research design and analysis together through workshops. Um, so these workshops provided training as well of the teams. Um, we talked about positionalities. We came from different um, qualitative backgrounds, agreed on aims. We also just used it to coordinate the data collection and analysis and ended up using these workshops as well um, to jointly interpret findings. We also had to think about boundaries for the purpose of sampling. Um, so we kind of asked the question, how do you scale up sensibly that it's still manageable? So we wanted to first purposefully sample case settings, so which seven countries, and then within in them wondered what would be a sufficient spread of sectors um, and professional roles. So in the end, we picked seven countries and we chose them to capture geographical, political, economic and policy variation. And then for our stakeholders, we cascaded from existing key informants to cover relevant sectors, um, organizations within these sectors, and then key roles um, for diverse information with sample. So we did a kind of stakeholder co-mapping with stakeholders because people in the settings can really help us to say, who do we uh, need to talk to um, to help us um, with enough information for our study? So key was, <clears throat> key was to keep the number manageable, but actually we also included some stakeholders that were perceived as politically important to include, um, and they might have elicited less rich um, information in terms of their technical expertise, but we needed to include them. So just as an example, if you want to cover stakeholders within a health ministry, of course, you could talk to the NCT focal point uh, or someone within um, health education. You might want to talk to the permanent secretary or you might want to interview the Minister of Health. So there are lots of different stakeholders you could think about and different levels of um, insight they might have in this process. We also wondered about cross-setting analysis, um, or in other words, how to see the wood from the trees when you have these 80 um, stakeholder um, transcripts. So how to analyze and synthesize across um, similar but distinct settings to gain insights for a region. 
Um, so first of all, we felt we need to approach it in quite a deductive way, quite a planned way. So we started with a sort of gap analysis um, and followed our analysis plan from there for each of the case study settings. And then we felt we really need to be theoretically guided in our analysis. And actually this whole study was um, based on a pilot study in an eighth country in Barbados, where the multiple streams policy analysis framework really served as well to analyze the data. So we just felt from the start that that might be a good starting point um, to understand these seven extra countries. And we also were theoretically guided by realist evaluation principles um, to account for the distinct contextual mechanisms and contexts. So we didn't want to just aggregate findings across the different um, uh, countries. And then finally, a typical challenge, how to retain context, keep sight of the context in each of these different um, countries. And one issue with this was how to secure anonymity for politically sensitive findings while retaining relative insights for each setting and political context. So in the end, uh, we represented data without attributing specific views and findings of policy shortcomings or successes to individuals, to organizations, or even countries and their governments. So some of these are very small settings and it's very easy to identify um, particular participants or even identify particular countries. So we only um, um, looked at specific policies and initiatives that we could name as good practice examples and name them specifically in reports and in action guides and evidence briefs. We did also produce reports just for the um, separate countries that could be a bit less um, de-identified. So just wrapping this bit up, some headline findings and thoughts. I thought I would give you some findings of this elaborate um, um, study across seven countries. And we did think there is promise in doing this large scale um, evaluation. And we found we did um, um, understand how these seven con contexts um, work, the kind of range of stakeholders um, and their um, insights in how the processes played out in different ways in the different set settings. So across the settings, we found that multi-sexual collaboration remained between the usual suspects. So for example, the Ministry of Health and Education when it came to um, school feeding, but not the Ministry of Agriculture. It was driven by individuals who held significant roles and traction across settings and that were somehow guided by our theoretical um, interest in multiple streams theory, um, look at policy entrepreneurs. Civil society felt mostly only nominally involved and rarely had in any of these settings. And most policy progress was made in the large and the resource stronger countries um, that included when they had just more personnel and where international blueprints existed. So tobacco control was the most progress made when there's an international framework that could um, follow. And all of them felt that regional efforts could be accelerated. And one thing they thought they sh uh, that should happening is a sharing of blueprints within the region. So these larger countries that made more progress should share their experiences and expertise with the smaller countries. So we did really find challenges in this research as well. Um, so we really felt it was important to consider the resources we have and how to best adapt standard research methods and processes. We felt we needed a clear theoretical and concept, conceptual framework for analysis. Uh, it was really difficult to think about context, especially the political context in which the researchers and the participa participants are situated. And we also thought quite a bit about transparent reporting of these approaches and interrogating the limitations. And I'm mentioning it because there's actually very little written about these larger qualitative studies and these kind of methodological considerations um, that we could um, call upon when we planned our research. And then finally, my third example, that's the active travel and synthesis study. Um, this was funded by the Academy of Medical Sciences as part of their um, Springboard Health of the Public 2040 round. Um, that's the only round that did around public health. So my thanks, uh, first of all, to Emily Haynes, our postdoc, who did most of um, the hard work on this project and then collaborators on that project that helped to conceive of the study. So that included Judy Green, James Thomas, Ruth Garside, Mike Kelly and David Ogilvy, who I think I spotted um, on the call here today. And my thanks also to the original researchers of these studies. So I was one of them for the commuting in Cambridge study. And a quick shout out to Amy, who was the main researcher um, 
qualitative researcher for the Traffic and Health in Glasgow study. So what did we do? Well, for this study, we pulled different um, qualitative data sets um, for a secondary analysis. So here, the second paper here is for the M74 study, um, the Glasgow study led by Amy um, for this paper here. Um, these were either separate small qualitative studies or part of larger NIHR projects. Um, and all of these um, studies aim to understand travel or mobility experiences and decisions. In my own study, I was really interested in looking at travel and mobility as social practices, not individual behaviors. So um, practices that are recursive and relational, learn from others, shared with others and other practices and shared, having shared social cultural meaning. And all of our studies, um, but obviously firmly anchored within their respective contexts, the one I was involved with within Cambridge. Um, but we all, or many of us asked how we might be able to identify transferable conditions for change for social practice. If you're interested in behavior change, but we want to see it look at travel, not as behavior, but social practice, what will be conditions um, for change of social practices? So we thought maybe pooling studies, um, a range of quality studies might help us to compare practices of active travel in different contexts across locations, ages, gender, modes of travel. M might that help us to generate a more diverse transferable data set? Um, and could we then identify a transferable theory of practice change? And this was really a proof of concept study to develop new methods to analyze large qualitative data sets and interrogate um, their use. So uh, thanks to the funder for um, um, funding such a proof of concept study. So these were our methods. So these are our um, slightly reworded five studies, but we captured um, age ranges from 12 to 80 through pooling these. Um, lots of different cities, London, Glasgow, Belfast, Cardiff, Cambridge, also rural areas. Um, lots of different travel modes and pulling this together we ended up with 280 transcripts. Now for the first part of our project we used a um, unsupervised machine learning software Leximancer and I will speak quite a bit more about this and how we went about using the software. But one result you get from using the software is um, a conceptual map so what's called an intertopic um, distance map and I will explain more how to read this kind of map in a moment. But from this sort of map, you then can pull text excerpts and we are back in our familiar territory um, of inferring meaning from the textual data, keeping sight of our social theoretical framing and obviously the original context from these different text excerpts. So just a little bit about um, machine learning. So there are two main um, um, ways of doing this. So one is um, supervised, um, a supervised approach of machine learning. So a supervised approach um, asks the researcher for rules to inform automated analysis. So the algorithm in these um, rely on trainings, so ideas or theories that we give to the system before it uses it to code a um, whole data set. So this works best if you have a large data set. So this is often used for um, social media analysis. So if you have 600,000 tweets, you want to um, automatically code. Um, and you give the rules to the software, so it can't be used to identify latent concepts or themes. Then on the other hand, you have unsupervised um, approaches. So that doesn't require rules or training sets. So the patterns are entirely driven from the data. Um, so the process automatically performs coding um, at this stage of analysis. Um, so in the past, they used quite simple algorithms, kind of identifying key terms and then applying those to code the rest of the data. But um, recent um, software um, has developed much more complex algorithms. Um, and they can identify not only keywords, but interconnections of the terms to identify what they call concepts and contexts. And I'll talk a bit more about this and what that might mean. But we wondered using the semi-automated text analytics, might that be maybe an efficient method to our large data set of 280 transcripts? It has been applied to primary research to define terms. It has been used to track changes in abstract content within journals. 
and it has, I think, mainly used uh, within systematic review processes, for example, to select search terms. But we haven't seen much use or um, interrogation of its use for qualitative data synthesis. So we just wondered, might this be an approach to uncover new interrelations, networks and patterns? And because we were quite familiar with the original studies, we were worried that we are a bit too close to the original study and our original analysis. So maybe that helps us um, to step back from our data. So we use Leximenser. It's a software um, developed by the University of Queensland. I think other software are available. To our knowledge, no open access data is available. So it performs an automatic unsupervised analysis of text. Um, it does two forms of analysis. One is semantic analysis, um, attributes of words, and one is a relational analysis. So looking at the frequency of occurrence or co-occurrence of um, words. And as I said, it uses this complex algorithm to identify concepts in context. Uh, it's sort of semi-automated. It doesn't, it doesn't quite work without any researcher input. So we had to tell certain things to Leximanza. So we had basic demographic information about the different data sets, um, like gender and like age. And you also have to tell um, format uh, transcripts in a certain way. So the software knows what is spoken by the participants and what might be spoken by the interviewer. So this is a intertopic distance map or a conceptual map, one of the main outputs. Um, so this provides a bird's eye view of the semantic data. So the colored bubbles illustrate key themes. That's what Lexman calls themes. The colors are heat mapped to indicate relative importance or interrelatedness. And then within the bubbles, um, there are collections of interlinked dots and they represent uh, concepts that make up each theme. And the proximity of the bubbles, concept dots, or tags to one another indicate conceptual similarity. So those clustered together are most closely related. And you also get these kind of word count um, outputs through Leximanza. And what we find most um, interesting and useful is that you can directly move to text excerpts, either through particular concepts or co-occurring concepts. So we needed quite a bit of time to get our head around the software and understanding if this might be useful for us. So the first paper we wrote about it is a step-by-step um, -step guide to use um, a particular software application, Leximans in our case. Um, and in this paper, we also just interrogated the opportunities and limitations of this kind of software for qualitative data synthesis. And here's sort of a quick result from this paper. So mainly we thought it's a really good use for zooming out of your data. So giving you this broad overview of broad categories like gender, age group, study site. Just in terms of study site, some things were unsurprising. So on the bottom here, when you look at the concept map, um, two studies in um, that um, cluster together is um, YW is the young driver study with under 18 year olds on their attitudes to driving, aspirations to driving, and the OTB on the buses study from London, which was about free bus passes for um, school kids in London. So that made sense that these two studies cluster together. But interestingly, our two um, cycling studies, so on the top is CO is the um, um, commuting in Cambridge study and CC on the right is the cycling in London study. They clearly didn't at all cluster together um, conceptually according to these algorithms. So it gave us a bit of a fresh lens to this. Uh, and then we found it really useful that it helped us to zoom in, navigate through the textual data and really zoom into a particular issue and compare that particular um, issue phenomenon across the different concepts. And so our next paper was to look particular at um, gender patterns within uh, active travel practices. And gender is probably an obvious um, um, topic to focus in on. Um, lots of studies about that, in particular qualitative studies that are really useful to understand gendered experiences um, in travel, mobility and transport. So this was our main output for this paper from Leximanza from the software on the left hand women and the right hand the map for men. And what we found most surprising is that um, among these themes and concepts, um, they don't actually display a marked difference between women and men. And in fact, 91% of the automatically identified concepts occurred in both gender groups, um, which surprised us. So we took these initial outputs 
and went back to the text extracts um, to identify um, how these um, um, uh, concepts might really play out in the way pe uh, people um, talk about them. So we coded the text to understand do the linguistic terms hold the same meaning or are connected in the same way in the two data sets as in for women and for men. Um, because we're interested in practices, we wondered how do these themes and concepts um, connote practices? And we wanted to explore gendered patterns in the practices themselves and the discourses about practices. So here are some um, findings for this. So we started with looking at these differences in practices themselves and how they interrelate. And our analysis was uh, guided initially by the maps that showed that the most frequently co-occurring concept with work was home, both for women and for man's, men. So we decided to treat this connection as describing the social practice of commuting, traveling from home to work and back. So looking at these then interrelated practices of commuting. So here, starting with the women. So in the text connecting home, where women spoke about how the journey is associated with their commute, um, they were bundled together with a series of um, uh, multi-functional uh, journeys. So that included things like the school run, uh, shopping, meeting friends, care responsibilities. So just generally doing other things en route from home to work or vice versa. And this um, quote here shows it really nicely. So at the end of the work day, there's very often something to do that means either going into town or getting to another location, which you just simply can't do on a bike or picking something up, I don't know, going to babysit my grandson. So then looking at the men, well, their text connecting home and work, this was less about bundled journeys, but more about sort of getting from A to B, so relatively linear journeys. Um, and that idea is evident here in this um, quote here. So I generally make sure that I've got anything happening after work that allow myself time to get home, get changed, freshen up a bit, and then go around than maybe going straight from work. So men also spoke about what we then called resulting practices that co-occurred as a result of the commute. But this was stuff like showering after cycling, getting changed, so practices that interlinked with the commute but happened afterwards in this more linear fashion. We also found um, similarities between uh, men and uh, women. Um, so this relaxing and taking time out um, of the commute was really found in both um, men and uh, women's transcripts. Um, so that was seen across the data sets um, and modes of travel as an act of separation between practice, um, between um, work and home life and how this contributed to well-being for everyone. So these are these um, different gendered um, 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 differences in the practices um, for men and women. But as a um, second um, analysis, we wanted to look at discourses of practice. In a way, we only have transcripts on how men and women talk about their practices. Um, and uh, we particularly looked at um, safety and danger for this and might be quite um, timely at the moment to talk about it. So this was initially flagged by the maps whereby women indicated direct concept connection between cycle and feel, as I show up there. Um, so when we explored the text extracts, we found that women internally framed their accounts. So how they feel, how modes of travel might make them feel, um, for example, cycling or as a, you know, the confidence as a cyclist. And then for men, feel wasn't really linked to cycle and in, in general feel wasn't, uh, was a less important concept. And instead the concept of cycling in the data was linked to road. So men refer to safety um, in a more externally framed way in terms of the context of the conditions being dangerous. Um, so the road being dangerous. Um, and the text that showed these differences all related to cycling because we identified them in niche initially with this co-occurrence with the term cycling. But um, there is a possibility within Leximanza to um, perform a sort of sensitivity analysis um, to look at the presence of the concept of feel and dangerous across the full data set. And our findings supported that the context um, of other more uh, confirmed this in the context of other modes of travel here for women about feeling safer across the safer with different modes of transport and then 
yeah, external ways uh, for men to frame um, safety issues like um, dangerous roads, dangerous people, and um, that a place isn't safe. So here are the bottom ones about the um, Glasgow study. And when I say we performed this sensitivity analysis, this was really our postdoc, Emily Haynes, who really got her head around this, um, this software. So then just summarizing these findings well, so we found gender differentiated experiences and travel narratives. So women and men travel differently. So women traveling through these multifunctional trips and men maybe in more um, terms of more linear journeys. And that holds up with evidence that shows that women are just more likely to trip chain as consequences of gender disparity and responsibilities around childcare or unpaid work. And we found this different way that many women might frame their accounts of travel dif um, differently. So particularly around reference of safety. And again, there's quite a lot written about especially safety issues around transport and travel for women. But we also wondered if there are other situations aside from commuting where these practices might sit together and we couldn't really um, um, explore this in our analysis. And we also wondered how maybe other factors might play out like age or location. So we clearly only just looked at um, gender. So we felt we couldn't gain a comprehensive understanding of these conditions for chain, that change that we set out to do. So just summarizing um, kind of our thoughts around this text analytics. So on the one hand, we thought that yes, it did facilitate a highly inductive data driven process. It did help us to some, zoom out of our data, step back a bit, um, but also it helped us to really focus in on um, this question of gender. So it provided an analytical fresh lens for us um, and it did help us to um, guide us towards novel linkages, maybe groupings of specific terminology that maybe we wouldn't have identified in manual coding. But this was just really the first step of our analysis. So it could only inform or be the starting point for researcher-led interpretive work. So all the other work with the text excerpts is back to the drawing board in terms of how we do qualitative data analysis. And it really wasn't necessarily a, um, a, a speedy process to do this. So it took us the good part of a year to um, to um, well get access to the data, get the ethical clearance, but clearance, but then also to prepare and standardize the transcripts. So just wrapping up now, what are the new promises and maybe all pitfalls? So I think I would say um, novel approaches can contribute to existing evidence and generate new insights and theoretical understandings. And I think it's well worth doing this. Um, I think it has the potential to enhance validity I think text analytics um, help for efficient exploitation of existing data to answer new questions. And I would say much remains though explored and transparently reported. So very little is written about these efforts. I don't think they're not necessarily hap um, not happening, but people might not really write about it. And there are these old pitfalls around ethics, just the limitations. I, if you like, can talk a bit more about approvals and kind of consent terms for doing secondary data analysis, issues around confidentiality that are important, issues around context that I think remain unsolved. So can we analyze text that's decontextualized? Um, do we need to understand the context in which the data is produced and analyzed? Um, so the researcher and their knowledge about the data. And can we transfer insights, for example, conditions for change really moving beyond these contexts? And as I said, transparency, I think maybe we do need to develop standards of reporting if we develop new, um, new methods, but then some of these standard reporting tools don't serve us that well in qualitative research. I can talk a bit more about the AI and text analytics and how that kind of introduces a whole new set of black boxes and analysis. And that I would say much, does remain to be explored, interrogated and written about and critiqued if we undertake more of this. So I, I started to say much of this was a proof of concept project. So I thought I should probably end up to saying, well, would we do this again? And actually, our next step on the um, ACT study, synthesis study, is that we're actually undertaking our meta-ethnography to understand conditions for social practice change. Um, so because our text analytics just helped us to zoom, zoom in to this gender um, aspect. 
but actually for the future, I am involved in quite a lot of policy analysis that are um, involving quite a lot of different settings and regions, so a lot of qualitative data. So I do feel semi-automated text analytics might help us for this first exploratory step and um, before we might do more um, traditional analysis. And actually, if it's your own primary data, it does make it more efficient. You know, you have the ethics clearance, you can um, set up transcripts from the start so they can be read by the software. But yeah, I'm just finishing with the thought that I think a lot more thinking, yes, needs to be done, but probably also a lot more research. So thanks very much. I thought I'd end with a picture from um, Cornwell, if you get a chance to travel soon again. Thanks very much. Thank you, Connie, for uh, an excellent and very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I'm just going to the chat box now and um, we have our first first question in uh, from uh, from Janet Boutel. Um, thanks, Connie. This is really interesting. I'm just wondering whether the AI is intrinsically limited as it can't separate the negative and the positive. Thinking of men versus women on their commute. Is it is it that is it that the software allows you to quickly move around the data, find appropriate excerpts, etc. I guess so. Is it like a an aid rather than a that's right, yeah, Janet, that's a good point. I mean, to be honest, these these maps, these outputs are quite mind boggling. They don't in itself make sense. And you do have to actually go back to the text excerpts to make sense of them. So I think they kind of indicate certain patterns you might have not thought about. Um, um, you know, I said either speech patterns like this feel and safety or certain patterns um, as in this multi-trips versus linear trips or so. So that's sort of something interesting, kind of a little flag that, that helps you to say, maybe we want to explore more. But in itself, if you stopped there, you couldn't, I think um, you wouldn't have any findings or results you could sensibly write about there in themselves don't make sense. Um, and I think in that way, this is how it needs to be treated. And then it, in a way, it doesn't make sense if it's positive or negative, because that's one step in your detective work then to find out um, why these might be sort of co-occurring concepts and why it might be worth exploring them. And it might well be that you look at that and say, well, they, it's sort of an artifact of um, whatever algorithm and there's really nothing sens sensible you can make out of it, um, out of that um, kind of output. Thank you, Connie. Um, questions are starting to flow through. So uh, the next one is from Susan uh, Jameson. Um, be interested to hear a bit more about the ethical approvals. I guess I don't, I don't know which for which the, the three projects, but yeah, if it is transfers across, did you need multiple approvals or was a leave? We did. Um, so first of all, we needed a kind of umbrella approval at the University of Exeter, which we now need for any secondary data analysis anyway. But they do want to check that initial consent is given by the studies for um, reuse of the data. So the bigger, um, actually most of the bigger NHR projects had this um, in their consent form. So at consent that the data could be reused for other projects that are similar um, um, questions. But some of the studies um, just sort of consented to that one study. Um, so we had to go back to these um, ethics boards. I think actually in Glasgow, we also went back to the ethics board. So we did go through three um, ethics boards again and asked them if we could re reuse the data. And, um, and luckily with none of them, for all of them, the consent form had covered enough um, around reuse, at least within the research team that we didn't have to re-consent participants. And I think we couldn't probably have done it within this project. Um, but I do know other sort of pooled uh, studies that pool data where they might have re-consented participants. But that's kind of quite important to think mm. about and that can take quite a bit of time. Thank you, Connie. Um... There's a couple of questions about the software. Um, so one was about if you could put a, a link up to, where, to the software that you used. And the, the other question was around how does uh, LexiMansa differ from other qualitative software such as NVivo? Yes, so um, I could put, um, I can Google briefly and put it in there. I think if you just Google for LexiMansa, it should come up. Um, um, 
others I think are available and we didn't, we actually didn't even speak to the team at Queensland. Um, we happened to take it because we started to partner with um, James Thomas at UCL, who used Leximenta before for systematic reviewing and together with um, Mike Kelly for evidence reviews, they kind of felt um, that particular software was useful. So we didn't go into big review of what different software might be. So there might well be others that are really useful and maybe by now there might be open access software available, which might be preferable. It was kind of quite um, sort of easy to use, um, I guess, for all of us who usually don't use that kind of software. Leximanza isn't a necessarily a qualitative software. So I think what in vivo does in auto coding and, and other like MaxQ Data, Atlas TI, I think they all have these auto coding um, uh, versions. But I think what they do is this kind of supervised way of coding. So um, they might um, or they might generate um, codes in terms of you know, uh, frequent keywords, and then you could auto code for these keywords, um, or you generate your own codes and then let the um, software do some of that hard manual craft for you. So I think in that sense, it's better to use in vivo. If all you want to do, you have a code book and it's a lot of work to code through all of them, that maybe that might be a useful first step. You use auto coding. And then you obviously want to check through them and say if a more inductive reading of it might generate or, or interrogate your codes a bit more. But I guess what we wanted to do is just to say we are so close to our own studies. Um, who can help us to maybe come up with patterns or interesting new ways of looking at the data that we might struggle um, to see ourselves. Um, so in that way, um, we found the software kind of interesting, you know, and because of these algorithms um, where they don't just come up with keywords, but try to say which are concepts that co-occur um, and how closely do they co-occur together. So this kind of relational almost network analysis it does for you, we just thought is quite interesting because we were after these sort of patterns in the data. But it is a bit of a first step toy, I guess, rather than that it does a substantial part of your analysis. Perhaps I can just pick up on that point, Connie, about patterns. And obviously, in terms of uh, quantitative research, uh, machine learning, people who don't like machine learning will, will say, well, all it's doing is, is picking up patterns. Uh, you're not sure if that's going to replicate elsewhere. So uh, kind of Building on that, did this issue about the different maps that were produced for men and women, was that was that from the software that found that or was that something a priori, a priori you had considered? And then a sort of a second issue in terms of validation, um, you know, in a, in a quantitative study, you might, you know, hold a bit of the data back um, to, to, to validate your findings. So, yeah, is there a potential for that kind of approach here? Yeah. yeah, so first of all, I think it isn't, it might promise sort of to add a bit of objectivity to your analysis, your otherwise very intuitive qual analysis. But we found that um, it is sort of quite a black box, these algorithms. And actually in the beginning, we just ran, we kind of just tried to run different. So we wanted to look a bit at age, agenda, see if we get different um concept maps and as you do this the algorithms learn from the data and it's actually not reproducible if you want to go back then to the gender bubbles a completely different map appeared um you know after having run these different things so we realized you need to actually start from scratch open the software again kind of run that first sort of gender analysis again that you would arrive at that first sort of concept map again so it introduces lots of uncertainties, actually, rather than that it helps you and adds sort of reproducibility into your qualitative process. And in many ways, probably doing it in person as a group of qualitative researchers might even be easier to describe and transparently describe and perhaps reproducible in terms of the process than what this algorithm does for you. Um, we sort of relax a bit into it by thinking, well, actually, these outputs only help us our initial thinking and what it helps us to do is to say which of these transcripts do we now want to pick out of these 280 that so help us to go you know we have co-occurring concepts so here seem to be concepts that talk about field cycle safety or so um, rather than to us sort of manually uh, need to come across these sort of concepts in the transcripts um, 
So it's sort of almost data management in that sense. Um, what we could do and what was possibly the sort of, I guess most of us were call researchers, but um, what we maybe intuitively did is um, talking about the discourses is um, this safety came only together with cycling. So initially any excerpts we had pulled were from the cycling study. So it was mainly from the Cambridge study and also the cycling in the city, the London study. So any of these issues around safety and how many women might talk differently about it only came up um, when the only excerpts initially were those from these two cycling studies. And then, to be honest, I don't know what the um, sensitivity analysis was that um, um, Emily performed, but basically we tried to look at um, kind of feel and safety across the other data sets. So although it automatically didn't find the core occurrence, I think you can ask it to look for the core occurrence in these other data sets. And then we did find it in actually all of the other data sets, which seemed really um, uh, interesting, especially, I don't know, they were quite different, especially the young drivers in Northern Ireland asking, you know, young kids about the aspirations of driving license attainment and all that. So it was interesting that we then found this sort of topic in these different studies. I don't know if that answers your question, but I think you can do that kind of tinkering with the data and understanding what might happen. Thank you, Connie. Um, another couple of things, I think, what one is more of a comment than a question um, uh, from Charlotte Wright. I like the idea of using an objective approach to mapping the data before interpretive uh, work begins. Um, another question about the software. Uh, have you used Leximansa or other tools to help anonymize text by flagging potentially personal information? Yeah, we haven't done that. That is an interesting uh, point. I think the difficulty about anonymizing is that, say, when somebody talks in the transcript of, um, I like cycling with my son, Adam, we wouldn't, um, we want to retain the son, you know, that's quite important information. So we don't want to just anonymize to say, I like cycling with A. It's important that there seems to be a parental practice here going on. What we see less often is when people just very quickly anonymize a transcript and, for example, take out place names and we would take out, say, um, I live in the village St. Agnes and we just turn it into the initial S. You know, someone with local knowledge knows that maybe St. Agnes has actually is quite remote, but actually has fantastic bus linkages, which might be important contextual information if I wanted to pull this for sort of transport travel secondary data analysis. But maybe St. Agnes happens to be a quite wealthy village and an otherwise wise, very deprived neighborhood. So if I wanted to pull this transcript and study for a sort of social inequality study, it wouldn't help me if somebody anonymized, um, you know, St. Agnes to S with a helpful bracket that they're great bustlings. You know, I need other contextual information for it. So I think that's the problem about um, anonymizing the qualitative transcripts and it's sort of the researcher who is I think best place for their own study to know how to best anonymize it to retain enough contextual information for your research question but it's sort of safe enough to kind of share with other people in the team and as soon as we get to this is an open access data set that anyone might want to use um, you know then then how useful is this data when someone with a particular topic in mind have anonymized it. So I'm saying this, there's a long way of saying if you now think a software would try to do the analysis for you, for example, only flag all the um, place names, say, I think that could be one helpful step. But actually, I think the, the, the most time you will need is figuring out how to best turn St. Agnes into a useful de-identified term rather than that it flagged the place name for you. I hope that answers the question. But yeah, I think it's no, that, was very, complex. that was very clear. Thank you. Um, I think that's us um, gone through all the comments, I think. Um, and I see uh, Connie has, uh, has put the link to the software website. Um, so that's, so that's, that's great. Thank you. Um, so there's two things I, I need to do. One is to uh, just remind you that the next Morris block is on 28th 
of uh, April, and it's going to be um, by uh, Harry, Professor Harry Rutter, and his title of his presentation is uh, Chess Not Checkers, the Need for a Complex Systems Approach to Public Health. That starts at 1pm, so that's a note for your diary. Um, and the other thing to do is for us to thank Connie very much for an excellent presentation. And, um, and, and we look forward to seeing how this work develops. Thanks very much. Yeah, happy to, um, obviously, if anyone wants to email me, I think I'm easily Googleable <laughs> if you have any other questions. Thanks okay. very much. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Great. For your participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jim, as well. You're very welcome. Some nice comments coming through on the chat for you. Yeah. <laughs> I might just, but Aud said she will also send me comments, didn't she say? Yeah. Shout out to David. <laughs> Thanks for joining. <laughs> and we can, um, yeah, we, I think the, in the recording, the, all the chat will be saved, I think, as well as the, obviously the, the, the audio. Brilliant. All right. Thanks very much. You're very welcome. Yeah, I think that went, that was, that was excellent. I think, um, it was a really good length as well, but it, it, you left that good time for the questions at the end. So I think I've yeah, been... never quite sure how to time it, but yeah, that's probably you don't want to speak for too long, but um, <laughs> fill the hour somehow yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, yeah, really interesting comments on it. I mean, we feel relatively new to text analytics, but um, it was a really interesting project, yeah. I think, I mean, obviously, from a quantitative perspective, it's int quite interesting that the kind of the issues you're coming up are kind of similar in, in terms of, well, as I said, you know, how do you know if you're just finding a, a pattern noise, you know, are you fitting, you know, in quantitatively, you'd be fitting a model to noise and yeah. whatever, whatever the qualitative equivalent of that is, you know, yeah. and how do you stop doing that? I think it's quite interesting. Yeah. I think it's nice and easy way to get to the transcript itself, but it kind of feels like you just added another step to analysis <laughs> rather than to <laughs> streamlined analysis. But um, I think we wouldn't have written these papers if we hadn't used it. Um, I definitely <laughs> think it gives a new view on the data. And I guess as core researchers, we are relatively relaxed about that. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. All right. Okay, well, all the best and... Um, lovely, yeah, it was lovely to meet you. It's such a shame I couldn't make it to Glasgow, uh, but um, yeah, shame. maybe some other time. <laughs> the, sun, the sun is shining here as well, I can't, you know. Yes, he, he is well. <laughs> That's so unusual for Cornwall, but... <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay thanks very much. Thanks, the best. Bye.